since we're live on the internet, we we might just start. I think some people will still come in, but uh, we'll see you later. Um, we'll do it in English because not everyone here is uh, Dutch. So uh, even though we're all Dutch, we'll try and talk English best as we can. Um, my name is Peter van der Wiele. I work for Dutch radio and television, where I do programs mainly on science and, and culture. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, project and the whole range of products of uh, responsible innovation or ethical engineering uh, with uh, Challing Sierstra and Jeroen van den Hoven, who have uh, both been involved with the project as a whole and several projects uh, right from the start. Uh, Jeroen van der Hoof is a philosopher at the University of Delft, the technical university, so it's um, it's a different role for a philosopher, I think, than if you would work at any other uh, university. Um, Schelling has also done uh, a lot of work with, with several articles and things. To start off with, maybe um, the simple question, what if we would have never engaged in this project? What if we would never have cared about ethical designing? What if everything would have continued as it was before? What would have happened? Um, I think we would have missed uh, a, a number of the, the interesting results that we've reached. Um, and I think there are a number uh, coming out of the projects that have been running in the last now four years. Um, and um, I think to judge by how they are received and how the policymakers and the people from industry react to them um, is, is that it's quite positive and they welcome it and they start to think about how to incorporate that into their daily work. That could be the engineering and research and development but also the policy, uh, the kind of the formation of public policies. And um, to give you an example of that, uh, we've been advising out of a project on uh, automated weapons and drones, we've been advising the, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and helping them to think through the position that the Dutch government would take um, in the international arena, going to Geneva and discussing uh, automated weapons and uh, killer robots, as they are colloquially, uh, colloquially called. Um, and so this is, a, this is a, definitely a very important and prominent um, item or topic and it's not, it's not trivial, you know, what to think of it and what to make of it. And so um, we've, straight out of our project, we've been able to kind of contextualize and suggest and, and help them think through, you know, the, the issues on the agenda. So I, I think that's a, that's a, there are other examples uh, to, the same, to the same effect. It's like when you buy a new car uh, and you're thinking about buying a certain model, let's say a Ford. From that moment on, on the street, you'll see a Ford everywhere. And I think it's the same with ethical design. Once you start thinking about it, you can see it everywhere. And, and in the newspapers over the last three or four years or so, um, it, it has been in the papers indirectly every day. Would, would you say that the time was right for the program? Oh, certainly so. It's, uh, it has been a much longer tendency. I think this program builds on existing initiatives to make technology more sustainable, for example, which is also an attempt to incorporate and embody societal values into the technology itself. Uh, another um, much longer uh, trend, of course, has been to incorporate uh, values with regard to safety and security. And we often forget that these are ethical values too, because they are so widely, widely accepted and then we tend to forget they're ethical. But at first there was struggle to get, uh, to make technology safe and secure and uh, there were health struggles. So in fact, what we see is a speeding up, I would say, of a much longer tendency. And the challenge is to incorporate a wider range of values in our technologies. Because only in that way we can ensure that the technology that we develop fits with society, and both society and technology can only flourish if there's such a fit. Would you not say that it's also a bit of a tragedy that this program is necessary because it should be part of any design, even without a program, it, it, should, it shouldn't even be a question whether ethics should be involved in any design. So is the ultimate goal of this program to end itself? Certainly. It's, um, um, it's 
often it's now a little bit a garden, but in the end you want this garden to spread all over the globe. Now, it's important to say that in corporations there's often already a lot done. And you don't need a program like this to, to start things up. But what you do need a program like this for is to reflect, to speed, to enrich uh, the ways that companies are already dealing with ethics. The, the, uh, the amount of subject is huge. We could spend, I think, three days talking about all the several cases of ethical designing. Um, I think that's also a problem for the program, that there's so many examples of possible ethical designing. How, how do you keep track of all that's going on and how do you choose what is relevant and what is not? Um, well, the, the keeping track is, uh, I mean, this is the reason why we organize these conferences and try to build a community of people um, that regularly interact and, and, and discuss their papers and their work and their progress. So that, that, is, that is a way of keeping track of, of all the things that happen. So forming a community and, and having communications in, uh, amongst each other. Um, so, um, and then what you see is a specialization in, uh, in, in the literature. You have dedicated books, dedicated journals now being started under this label. And uh, of course, also an important, I think, achievement indirectly of this program is, is that the European Commission has taken the research councils, the Dutch research councils initiative as a benchmark um, to think about and to design their um, responsible innovation initiative in Brussels. So that I think that is a feather in the cap of the Dutch research council. It shows for the success. Absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, they're very critical because, of course, there you have always the tension between the market, the corporations that are lobbying for their kind of short-term, more economic and financial interests, and they're always afraid that you know they will be pushed out of the market uh, and lose market share if we take the moral high ground in Europe, whereas the rest of the world keeps polluting and kind of uh, take, cutting corners. So that's uh, um, so it, it, it was quite um, a job to convince the people in Brussels that this is something that should be explicitly written into the program because it has that risk, more or less, uh, quote unquote, of, um, of, of making it difficult on ourselves. A, a simple example, we, we had the affairs around uh, Edward Snowden, uh, um, the privacy uh, question. For instance, Facebook, within five years everybody, almost everybody was on Facebook. And suddenly people start thinking, what is it doing to my privacy? They don't want to give up on their social networks, but they also don't want their privacy to be invaded. Mm -hmm. I think here is a typical example of unethical designing. It was just pushed onto the internet, people um, became member of it, and then everybody started thinking about the ethical consequences. Mm -hmm. Could it have gone otherwise? Is, is it even possible to design something like that without having these kinds of problems afterwards? Because it usually goes that way. That's certainly possible. One of the key elements of responsible design is to anticipate. Uh, to anticipate on the possible impacts of your technology in society. To, and one way to anticipate those impacts is to invite early on stakeholders, so the, pros uh, the projected users of your technology, ask them in, help, uh, ask them to help you design a technology that they would want, that would match their values and their concerns. So it's one way to uh, uh, forestall failure. I think Facebook is also a very good example of why this program is so very timely, in the sense that we see a whole new uh, family of technologies evolving that are called intimate technologies and are, that are getting really close to us, that really invade our life world, our private world, who we are, uh, our daily practices. And people, uh, people wouldn't want to live without their cell phones anymore. So the question is no longer do we want technology or not. Now technology is here and our existence is entangled with technology. 
but this makes it all the more important for ever more people to have a say in how do we appropriate that technology, but also how can we influence the technology that shapes our daily existence. Now, Facebook is an excellent example, which also makes me very happy, because you see that there were all these doom stories, but society is also resilient. There are always learning processes. That's Two years ago, we would have thought, oh boy, everyone is willing to forfeit their privacy rights. And nowadays, you see that there's a backlash, that there's discussion, and that people are, no, are, are, are learning by doing how to incorporate Facebook into their lives in a responsible fashion. And on the other hand, it has given rise to a new kind of... Um type of services and products and you know, the, the, the companies are already anticipating also they know that, that people will be watching out for their privacy so they're starting to think about designing privacy respecting technologies you know, 10 20 years ago that would, would not have been you know, uh, crossed their minds but now it is definitely on, on the table and they're thinking so if you look for example um, Google for uh, privacy marketing and you think that you get something to read on the privacy of marketing uh, this is, uh, you, what you get is uh, how privacy can be used to market your products and services because it is definitely a selling a, a selling point. And Maybe that's a, that's a, uh, an important point because it could also make the difference between winning or losing absolutely. for companies. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've seen that in 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 other non-technical uh, areas where companies have actually suffered as a result of of uh, unethical. Uh, performances and, and, and actions. <clears throat> so that is um, um, that is some, something that is definitely on their minds, yeah, as it should be. You said uh, the important thing is to anticipate. I think that's also the difficult thing. How do you know which questions will be important in seven, eight, or ten years' time? Hmm. You would have to be a brilliant innovator to know where everything is going. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and even then you won't. If there's one thing that we've learned in the previous century, the future can't be predicted. So um, let's not try to. On the other hand, we can't afford not to think about the future. Even if you, if you invest in a technology, you have some ideas where this technology will land, whether people will like it or not. Um, so the point is we, we can't not think about the future and therefore we are on, uh, under an obligation to do it better, because now often it's, uh, we are torn between equally unrealistic and inflated hopes on the one hand and fears on the other hand. And I think it's uh, a shared um, responsibility for technology and for society to come up with uh, better scenarios of what might happen and where we want to go. This is also the question, which is in the end the important question of philosophy, what is a good life? We talked about privacy, we talked about health and safety already. These are all things that we feel are fundamental to lead our lives the way we want to. But is, is that the key point in, in responsible innovation, to know what is the good life? Well, I think it's, it's an important point that we cannot avoid addressing at some at some stage and and these issues will come up when you kind of pursue an ethical analysis um, to the end you will you will get to those questions whether whether you prefer to live your life this way where we want our children at the tender age of four years to be glued to the screen 24 7 and and look at the content that we may have you know critical ideas about um, you know the, the quality um, or whether we want them to spend some time outside, you know, playing with their friends in, in, the, in the sandbox. And so, um, and the same for travel, international travel, and for, um, and some of the papers have addressed that during the conference here on the naturalness of food or of, you know, the, the, the products and the chemistry that we do. Um, whether we want to go back to a bio-based model or we want to and, and learn from nature or we pursue kind of artificial and even more artificial um, kind of products. Um, right now we are talking about uh, the good life and then the technology comes in and we have to protect the good life from technology. You could also say that technology is constantly being used to promote the good life or 
even to enhance human beings or to make us into the good persons that we never were before. Well, the promise is always that the technologies create a space for people to decide themselves how they want to live. Because they say, well, the technology promises I'll make life easier for you, thereby giving you more time to pursue your own goals. Of course, in reality, we see that the more time-saving devices we develop, the less time people have left. So everyone knows this. Eh? We have the picture of the manager who can, doesn't have to work in the office because now he can work in the meadow. But of course, that's the advertisement. Unfortunately, the same mobile technology makes, has as a result that he has to work 24 hours a day and he has to be available all the time. So the point is that these technologies, they shape our lives and people experience this ever more and this also uh, sets in action these learning uh, processes. There is one other issue because you're talking about the good life. I think it's also important that another value is justice. If you say we want to develop new technologies in collaborating with people in society, it's very important that not only the powerful actors are listened to, but that are also the people who are marginal, have more uh, have less influence on the agenda. And I think that's where good marketing starts to differ from responsible innovation. That you're not listening simply to a few parties, but that you think who is affected by this technology and thus has a moral right to be heard when we develop this technology. So it only means for the, the designer more requirements. Um, more requirements, yeah. yeah. In, I mean, there are um, definitely it, it will be demanding for engineers in the future. Although you also have to, uh, working with engineers and engineering students, you have to uh, observe that they really like complex problems. And so, if you if you make it more difficult for them, and say, well, you know, in addition to doing a robust um, device uh, which has this capacity and it is it's red and this tall. Uh, it also has to, you know, respect privacy of the user, and it also has to uh, be safe and secure, etc. Then they will, at some stage, will will see that as a, as an extra challenge, as an extra exciting challenge. And, so and, this and don't underestimate how re rewarding it is. If you feel that you contribute to good technology, that's a an incredible uh, reward in itself. And if you talk to engineers who have this sense. Their enthusiasm is quite uh, radiate. Well, if we talk about rewards anyway, uh, let's talk about incentives. Because mm -hmm. you might come to a point, I think, when you start thinking about ethical designing, where you have to rethink the whole process of designing and rethink the whole structure of designing and have to reestablish what the real incentives are for the designer. OK. Uh, um well, it, it, let's say it's, you, make a, you raise a very important point and also a point that we should look at in the future because ethics is not an individual affair. We always think ethics is something that happens in your head, but ethics is an institutional affair. We have to reorganize let's say, our industries and firms so that they enable an, uh, everyone uh, to be on their best. Um, to close up with, how will the program continue? What can you say about that? Um, so it will run for um, a number of years and we're already discussing next phases of the program. So we have worked together with the departments and the ministries. We've worked with the, uh, with, um, the, the, the private sector and, and companies and probably we're looking at a mix of, of both the private and the public for the next uh, rounds. But for the moment, we were still, I mean, also inspired by the success and the number of applications and the, and, and, and the positive feedback we received, both na nationally and internationally, we'll pursue uh, further stages and further development of the, of the, of the project. And um, um, I think the challenge is just to make it m even more relevant and even more um, integrated with processes that are, are taking place in society and, and relevant for, for innovation and also to put it on more squarely on the agenda uh, and in the mind before the mind's eye of the people who are taking the real kind of important decisions that are shaping our society uh, and that is the active politics here in, in, in The Hague.
and I'm quite you know, positive about their receptiveness and their openness to incorporating these ideas because uh, from the, the experience that a number of, of ministers have had in trying to sell the unique Dutch products and innovations, they've already sensed that the rest of the world is no longer uh, interested in just the technology or just a clever piece of engineering. They want things that are fitting for a, so for a society, whether it's in the, in the Far East or it's in South America. And so the experience of, of some of the members that are ambassadors of the program, um, for example, with big engineering companies, is, is that um, they're doing a new h harbor or port in, in South America. But it's not just the brick walls or the you know concrete, but it's the it's the social uh, socio-economic setting, it's the cultural setting that is important, and that is what the Dutch can bring because we have some experience, and that we are now becoming more and more articulate and more aware that we have been doing this and even enhancing that performance. So I think that is a very positive message that that could also be used to the to the benefit of the of the Netherlands as an export nation. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Does anyone here have any questions? Yes, in your talk, you focused a little bit on, on the ethics and the technology, which are important parts of responsible innovation, but of course, it's, it's much more than that. It's not just technology, but about innovations in general. Mm -hmm. So think about uh, healthcare systems in transition, energy systems in transition, water management. Mm -hmm. And another important thing of responsible innovation is the interaction eh, between disciplines. Eh, so uh, ethicists working together with people from social sciences and technology uh, uh, researchers. Can you uh, say a little bit, um, 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 can you explain a little bit why this interaction is so important for, for the responsible innovation program? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I mean, these, these grand challenges or these social, um, big social problems are extremely complex. Uh, it's, 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 it, it won't be very helpful to single out one particular aspect and say, oh, sorry, we're just looking at the cables. Or, oh no, sorry, we're just looking at the people kind of using the cables. Or, or we're just looking at the regulation. You have to take all of these things together. So in designing and thinking about responsible infrastructures, in a very natural way, this leads to a discussion and, and, and coordination of all of those elements of these, what we refer to as socio-technical systems. And so you have to do them in one fell swoop. You have to see how regulation, incentive structures, the governance of the data uh, are interacting with the people who are using you know, the backbone, but also the middleware and the applications. And, and so you have to have a more or less holistic view on that. Uh, and therefore, you need to and involve all of those people. Yeah. Uh, we, we find in practice that these multidisciplinary approaches absolutely crucial for success. It also comes with its own challenges because the people coming from different backgrounds, uh, they speak different languages often. And um, what we think is really important for the future is that also in the education of future engineers, but also social scientists and also ethicists, that in their education there's more training to be open uh, to collaborate in these interdisciplinary fields because the problems of the future will often require uh, this multi-perspective approach. Hi, hello. I'm one of the foreign visitors, as you can tell from my accent. Uh, pleased to, to hear such a an exciting discussion indeed. Um, we're at a, a conference of researchers. Hirhorn, when uh, responding to one question, said how important these conferences are. I just wonder whether you're searching or have searched or will search to do some things that actually bring a wider audience into the discussion around RRI in its various uh, forms, i.e. might bring together industrialists or policy makers or NGOs, CSOs. Have you given that some thought and has it been happening already? Can you tell us about that? Thank you very much. 
we've definitely been thinking about it. Actually, we've also been doing uh, uh, that. Uh, I mean, it's part of the design of the program, I would say, that we guarantee uh, a, a certain level of, of involvement of exactly those uh, groups uh, because we've designed it into the, the, the projects. So it's, it's a requirement to get funding under this program that you involve in your project um, a, a user panel or a valorization panel, as we as we refer, uh, refer to it, uh, and um, and so that you 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 interact with them at the beginning when you're defining some of the the, the major questions, but also in the process and at the end, um, and you're also asked to um, organize these events, um, and of course, what we at some point uh, in, in in the program want to do is to bring those people together. And also in the new calls for the new program, we've, we organize um, meet and greets for, pe for people outside of the research community so that they can come in, in, in contact with each other and, and find, uh, you know, matches of, of common interests. So that's definitely what we want to do. Okay, well, one last question. Uh, Yes, uh, thank you. Jeroen Hasselaar from Radboud UMC Nijmegen. We have actually done a project in the MVE program. We are doing this for um, uh, telecare uh, in, in patients with advanced cancer. And uh, that's uh, nice to, to say something to your question, is that we indeed have some collaborations with commercial uh, companies who provided systems in which we can communicate with patients at a distance. And our um, uh, healthcare staff has uh, learned to work with this. And, and the patients are, are really appreciating it. And, and now we are also evaluating this. So this is one of the nice examples, for example, um, from this pro uh, program. And I really hope that you will, will pursue, pursue this uh, for further uh, innovation in healthcare also. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Well, thank you all, everybody. Uh, I think it's time for lunch now, if I'm okay. right. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, you have been okay. Thanks.